They finally grant me visiting access to Charlie's ward at the hospital. Only two of the other beds on the ward are occupied at the moment, and all three occupants are fast asleep. This is Charlotte Lucas, I whispered to Ben, approaching the nearest occupied bed. She is Slack's girlfriend, and also my younger cousin. I glance towards Ben and see that he has remained in the ward entrance, lingering there. What happened to her? He gasps, his voice hushed. I look at him without saying anything, hoping my grave expression will do all the talking, and raise an eyebrow. His eyes widen as he puts it together. Thomas Slack did that? That sounds like provocation, right? I look down at her sleeping form and move round the bed to tenderly stroke her hair. He's a monster, if you knew half the things she's been through. I lean down and gently kiss her bruised forehead. Why isn't he locked up? Ben says, still stationed in the doorway. I wish I knew, I reply, before noticing a figure behind him and tensing up, my voice taking on a malicious edge. Speak of the devil. My face darkens and my jaw tenses as I step round the bed, stationing myself between him and Charlie. Miller, slack purrs, in his annoying smooth voice as he steps round Ben, almost like he's not there, and nods a greeting at me, his eyes flickering towards Ben for a second. Who's your friend? He is smiling, but his expression is full of animosity. What the hell are you doing here, you lowlife? I growl, my fists automatically balling up at my sides. Staring at him, my breathing becomes a little more pronounced, and the desire to beat him into a coma becomes almost impossible to resist. I have as much right to visit her as you do, he says, knocking back the remains of the drink in the cardboard cup in his hand. I heard about your handiwork, by the way. He is smirking now, and it makes me want to punch him even more than I usually do. You raped a college girl, beat a copper, and you're still walking the streets. Slack sounds almost impressed. Nice work. Get out, I snarl, taking a menacing step towards him. Here's someone I don't have to hold myself back from hitting. Or what? He snarls back, taking a step closer himself, and looking as ready for a fight as I feel. You're not welcome here, friend. Ben says evenly as he steps in with his back to me. <clears throat> I suggest you leave now. I was just about to swing for him and managed to stop myself before I knocked Larter out that moron. What's he doing? I'm sorry, Slack scowls, not sounding it, and breaks eye contact with me to glare at Ben. Who are you? I could make your life very unpleasant, Ben says, an edge to his voice. If you don't leave right now... I'm going to start by getting hospital security up here and having you kicked out. Slank just stares at him, open mouthed, like he can't believe someone else has the gall to stand up to him. You can't threaten me, he protests, his face twisting into a scowl. I'm going to break your legs, I growl, shoving Ben aside and turning my body in readiness to swing for him. Ooh, was that a threat, Slack loves? I've heard that before. Mike, please, Ben says at the same time and shakes his head. Nobody asked for your input, friend, Slack says, glancing at Ben. Unable to hold back any longer, I punch Slack in the face, putting all my pent-up frustration and aggression into the blow. There is a loud crack as my fist connects, and Slack groans, staggering back backwards a couple of steps, his face twisting into a mask of pain. That was a promise, arsehole, I growl, my teeth clenched together as I snarl at him. Without giving him time to recover, I hit him again following that up with a punch to the abdomen. Slack groans again and doubles over, coughing before sinking to the floor. His nose is leaking a trail of blood across his face and t-shirt. Ben rather wisely doesn't try to intervene again. You bastard, I growl, staring down at Slack, my anger not fully vented. Mike, Ben gasps in shock, but I hardly hear him. Looking around, I spot a discarded pair of crutches on one of the empty beds, nearby and a slow smile spreads across my face perfect ben makes a verbal protest as i grab one of the crutches but i ignore him you're funny snack snarls slack snarls sorry too many s's the pain he is in clearly not concealing the malice rapist as i swing the crutch through the air towards slack's legs the look on his face right before the crutch connects is one of pure horror his eyes ready to pop out of their sockets as he realises I'm not messing around. It makes me want to laugh out loud. Mike, no! Ben protests, as if his words will make a difference. 
Slack is already sprawled on the floor and he curls up clutching his legs whilst crying out even louder than before as if he's in great pain. Miller, for God's sake, Ben gasps. As I raise the crutch in the air to strike again, he grabs hold of the end of it, stopping me. Yanking hard on the crutch, trying to free it, I glare over my shoulder at Ben. If you don't let go this second, I'm going to hurt you, I tell him, the words coming out through my teeth. This has been a long time coming. He relents, still looking overcome with shock. I quickly raise it higher in the air over my shoulder and strike Slack's legs with a hard second, hard with a second blow. Never mind this ward, Slack is making enough noise to wake up the entire floor. I hit him with it a third time, enjoying his agony. Then I toss the crutch back onto one of the empty beds and aim a hard kick towards Slack's face. He makes a strange noise and his wails of agony suddenly fade into whimpers as he covers his head with his arms. Jesus, Miller. Ben gasps, putting a hand on my arm. Please stop now. I glare at him wordlessly, wishing he wasn't here. I could quite easily beat this loser unconscious. In fact, nothing would give me more pleasure. Turning my attention back to Slack, I watch him curled up into a defensive ball on the linoleum and bleeding all over the place, a slow grin spreading across my lips. This weekend is starting to look up. I hurt somebody who deserves it, and it feels good. Really good. In fact, I'm very tempted to kick him again, but Ben steps between us in the way. I settle for stomping on the lower part of Slack's leg, which is nearest to me as hard as I can. Still angry with Slack, my breath is coming in short gasps, my muscles tense and the adrenaline flowing. After I don't know how long, Slack gets to his feet, wiping his shirt sleeve across the bottom of his bloody nose, his wary eyes fixed on me. His jaw appears to be swelling up on the side where I hit him, the skin turning un an unnatural colour. Ben is still planted between us, and he now puts a restraining hand on my chest. I need to whip his ass, I say, meeting Slack's wary stare with my own hard glare. No, Ben insists. My God, you've done enough already. I'm not scared of you, Slack declares, sniffing and spreads out his arms. But his voice sounds different. His face pulls into a taunt grimace, as if it hurts to say the words. Let's go. All right, what's going on here? declares the security guard as two of them step onto the ward. I briefly glance at the two security guards, but keep my attention fixed on Slag. He's just leaving, Ben pipes up, nodding towards Slag. Slag is still watching me with a wary look on his face. I think he might be scared of me, but if that's the case, he's doing all he can not to show any outward sign of it. What? Slack questions as the guards move to escort him out. All right, let's go, one guard says, sounding bored and uninterested. Unable to resist one last dig, I grin broadly and say, Don't forget, Slack, I know where you live. Oh yeah? He gasps, suddenly appearing reluctant to go along nicely with the guards, and definitely in a lot of pain. It shows in his voice. Well, I know where you live too, and if you touch me again, I'll double it on her ass. The smile slips off my face. Why you? Where he's moving towards him, intent on swinging for him again. But Ben forcibly restrains me. Touch her again and nobody is ever going to find your body. He just smirks at me. At least that's what I think it's supposed to be. He looks to be in too much pain to be capable of a smile. Maybe all that wailing wasn't just for show after all. The guards fight hard to get him out of the ward doorway. Get off me, Lata, I exclaim, trying to shake off his hands. I'm going to break his neck. Just let him go, Ben pants, still gripping me hard, his body between Slack and I. And you, Slack shouts angrily at Ben his expression turning and the strain of fighting against the guard showing in his voice. I don't know who you are, but I'll find out, and I'll see to it that you regret threatening me. Come on, one of the guards grunts. They finally wrench his fingers free of the door frame and drag him off down the corridor. Slack's definitely limping. Only when he's out of sight does Ben release me. Mike, Charlie croaks from behind me. I catch the worried look on Ben's face before I turn to smile at Charlie. Don't worry, I reassure Ben, patting his shoulder. He's nothing but hot air. <clears throat> I move along the side of the bed towards Charlie and gently embrace her. How are you doing? She doesn't say anything, but I notice her eyes are flitting between my face and something over my shoulder. Realising that she doesn't know him, I remember my manners. He's really not worth the effort, Ben says. This is Ben Larter. I gesture towards him with my hand. Hi there. Ben smiles. But I mean it. I, But I mean, I understand why you do it. Yeah, that's what Kirsten's always telling me, I sigh. I'm Lottie, Charlie croaks, attempting to smile back at him. 
Nice to meet you, Ben says. Uh, who's that, Mike? Did I start to say, but then look towards Ben with a frown. You what? Who's Kirsten? Ben repeats. My lawyer. I turn my attention back to Charlie and wipe the sweat off my forehead with my bare forearm. Oh, Ben sighs. Okay. He pushed me to withdraw my statement to the police, Charlie croaks, before I can finish asking her about Slack. It's like she knew what I was going to say. He tried to strangle me, said I better tell the police I made a mistake, or next time, next time, she stops talking because she has gotten herself into such a distressed state she can no longer get the words out. Hey now, I whisper, sitting on the edge of the bed. She embraces me and cries into my chest. My cheek resting on the top of her silky haired head, I and arms around her, I comfort her the best I can. Do you know if he's been arrested or questioned? I ask, wishing I'd done more damage to him. I feel her nod into my chest. That's why he was so angry with me, Charlie says, her voice muffled. But what if he comes back? Tell the police, Ben pipes up, they will protect you. I'm going to wring the life out of his scorny little neck, I growl, my voice distorted because it's coming out from between my teeth. I have half a mind to chase down those security guards and beat that loser into a coma right here. OK, visiting time's over, ladies and gentlemen, a voice announces from behind me. I look back and see a nurse stood there. Just relax, OK? I kiss Charlie on the top of her head and get to my feet. I'll take care of him. She sniffs and tries to put on a brave face. OK, she whispers. Here, Ben says, stepping forward. He has a hanky in one hand and with one tender movement wipes the tears from one of her cheeks away. You can keep it if you want. It's clean, I promise, Ben smiles, OK? She stares up at him, slightly open-mouthed. She hesitantly takes it from him. Thank you. She sniffs again and clutches both his hands and the handkerchief, still gazing up at him. I'll see you later. I say, look after yourself, Ben says, extracting his hand from hers. Then he follows me out the door. Hey, Miller, I didn't want to say any this in front of all those people, Ben says, sounding worried. Something has come to my attention. What's that? I sigh. He glances around the quiet hospital corridor before continuing. Are you intoxicated? No. I glance briefly at his, into his suspicious face before averting my gaze. Of course not. Then I remember the beers I downed at home. Okay, maybe, I shrug, casting my gaze out of the window the row of windows running down one side of the corridor beside us and into the darkening sky. So what? He doesn't say anything else about it, though. I glance at him again and the, as the silence hangs between us and he just looks at me with wide eyes, his hands shoved into his trouser pockets. It's a bad idea to face him in that condition, he says. Whatever, it doesn't really make a difference, I sigh, shaking my head. Do you get the picture, though? I push open the double doors at the end of the corridor and hold it open behind me for him. Absolutely, thanks, he says, starting down the stairs behind me. Do you get arrested for fighting with him? His voice echoes into the hollow stairwell, making it sound a bit louder than it normally is. All the time, I frown and grind my teeth together as I remember how much I want to beat him into a coma. You know something, Ben? Every time I see that loser, I just want to put him in hospital. Yeah, so I see, mate, he says, dropping my voice a bit in att an attempt to avoid my next words echoing down the stairwell, I add, or the mauled. There's a moment of silence, filled only by the sound of our feet padding against the steps. Mike, don't take this the wrong way, but please don't do anything crazy, he says. I can tell from his tone that he is considering that I might well be capable of, of whatever drastic event has leapt into his head. I don't want to have to testify against you in court. It's almost as if he knows what I've been thinking. Crazy? I love hearing the way my voice sounds far away, please. Every time I go through this shit with him and Charlie, it gets a little bit harder to deal with. Every time I promise it will be the last time, but it never is. I can tell her that he's no good for her, that she can do better than this. She deserves a man that will treat her right, and it makes no difference whatsoever. I think she knows deep down that I'm right, but all Slack has to do is snap his fingers, and she goes running back to him, probably apologising or making stupid promises. This really has to be the last time. You know, I think you broke his jaw, he points out casually. I know, I smile. Serves him right. 
Yesterday I told him next time we meet, one of us will be taking a dive off Carrow Bridge wearing concrete boots, and it won't be me. To me that idea sounds so much more appealing. There is no guarantee that I have it in me to actually kill somebody, but I might make an exception for that waste of space. It doesn't help that I get all kinds of crazy urges every time I set eyes on him. I don't think that was an empty threat, you know, Mike. He gasps. He seems more than capable of taking it out on that poor girl in there. Be careful. Oh, no, no, no. I am shaking my head. I'm not going to tiptoe around that arsehole just because he's looking for another excuse to beat Charlie some more. We're way past that point, Larder. Next time I'll crack him over the head with something a lot harder than crutches and he'll take a nice long nap. Miller, you're starting to scare me now, mate. He puffs, sounding as freaked out as he looks. I look at him sideways and exhale a long, slow breath. Sorry about what I said in there, by the way. I say, about hurting you, I mean. It's okay. He waves the, away the apology. I was probably a fool to get in the way. There is a moment of silence as we step out of the doors that lead into the car park. You know, there are other far more effective ways to get one over on people like Tom Slack, Ben smiles mysteriously, and you don't have to lay a finger on him. There is? I question, frowning in confusion. It all depends on who you know, he says. There is a smile in his voice now. I look at him and he looks back at me as we stop walking. I'm pretty sure I have absolutely no idea what he's getting at. Look, Ben, I've had a nightmare day and I'm tired. If you're going to talk in riddles, I'm not going to be able to keep up. Come on, mate, Ben gestures widely with his arms. Don't tell me you've forgotten who you're talking to. Only one of the best reporters this side of the Norfolk border. I look at him, a slow smile spreading across my face as I realise what he's getting at. Oh, that's good, I laugh. That's so good, Ben. Why didn't I think of that? You said it yourself. You're tired. He smiles kindly and claps me on the shoulder. Come on, I'll give you a ride home. With that, he starts walking towards the end of the car park where he parked his car. Thanks, I say with a yawn and plod along behind him. What a day. I don't know what I want to do more. Get back home or get drunk or go to sleep or just sit and cry for an hour. We arrive at his car and I look across the car park towards the noise of his siren. An ambulance accelerates down the slip road outside the ambulance bay, access to A&E, heading away from the hospital building with its blue lights spinning. There is a dull thud as Ben unlocks the front passenger side door from inside the car, and I pull it open, grateful to be able to climb in. His car is an old Ford and it doesn't have central locking. Ben has the radio on all the time in his car and some current pop song that I can't identify hums out through the speakers. As he drives away from the hospital, I pull out my phone from my pocket and punch in Chrissy's number. Oh my god, I heard Mikey. She gasps down the line as soon as she picks up. In fact, I'm just on my way round to see you. I'm not home right now, Dolly, I say, using the nickname name I gave her and fighting to suppress the emotions her worried tone of voice has brought out. But I'm on the way. Are you okay, hun? She says. Her soft, whispery voice is laced with concern and it leaves tears welling my, in my eyes and a lump in my throat. I don't know how I'm going to cope when I see it etched on her face. Just about, I whisper, swallowing the lump in my throat. I'll see you soon. I hang up, slipping the phone back in my pocket and stare out the window. The yellow glow of the sun, of the setting sun is fading into the horizon, leaving the sky streaked with patchy, pinky, orange clouds. I didn't realise it was so late already. I stare out at the passing streets, lit by the soft glow of the streetlights, without really seeing them. This weekend was meant to be fun, not like the way it has turned out. So far, the only fun I've had is trying to break Slack's legs. Deep down, I'm still hoping this is all just a bad dream, and I'm going to wake up any minute. Things like this just don't happen to guys like me. Sorry, what? I say, realising Ben is talking to me. Are you okay? He repeats. His eyes are still fixed on the road ahead, but he sounds worried. No, not really. He turns into Ryder Avenue and pulls up to the nearby curb. I notice several things at this point. Number one is that we have stopped way down the street from my house. Number two, there appears to be a group of people congregated further down the street, probably outside my house. And if that be the case, I bet you ten to one they are journalists. Also, Ben is looking at me apologetically. I'm sure you will be, don't worry, he says, sounding more enthusiastic than he looks. I wish I could say I share his optimism. I'm just going to drop you here, OK? He licks his lips. It's not that I don't want to be seen with you. It's just that I'd rather not risk flattening any of those idiots. I almost did that once. 
I don't know what he's talking about. It could just be a lame excuse or actually a true story he's referring to, but I'm too tired to care which it is. Sure, Lata. Thanks, though. I sigh, opening the car door. Take care, Mike, OK? He says. And don't worry about your chocolates. I'll drop them at the police station for you. OK, I mumble, shutting the car door behind me. I stroll across the street in front of his car and hold up my hand in parting. There's no denying this is a nightmare. It's just a shame it's real life. As I get closer to my house, I hear voices floating down the street, punctuated by laughter. I told you I have no idea, Chrissy's amused voice says. The group I saw are definitely journos, and apparently she's waiting for me with them. That was Barry Whitemore, a guy with a camera hanging around his neck smiles. How can you not get it? She's so sweet and friendly. She can apparently get on with almost anybody. Hopefully she's even managed to avoid discussing me with them. Since it sounds like they are playing charades, I guess she's managed it. I've never heard of him, she purrs. OK, we'll let you off then, grins a man with no camera hanging, glancing in my direction. I watch his smile slip away quicker than Lance Armstrong's cycling career with a feeling of dread and suddenly they are all looking at me. I greet them with a tight smile, the nervous butterflies parading in my stomach are starting to make me feel sick as I desperately dig in my pocket for my keys. We saw your girlfriend, girlfriend leaving earlier. The only other journo here without a camera says. Pulling out my keys, I search the ring for my door key wordlessly. That sounded like one hell of a fight, another of the men points out. Top marks for observation. I step forward and slot my key in the lock as their cameras flash. You've really got nothing to say, Mr Miller. That's right, I say, glancing at them as I ushered Chrissy into the house ahead of me. Did you hit your girlfriend? The first reporter says. Too tired to put on my game face, all I can do is hope the guilt is not written all over it. No, I rasp quickly as I quickly shut the door. Then I lean my forehead against the back of the door and shut my eyes. They all know about that already. They don't really need me to confirm it for them. Those paps will most likely have photos of Eve battered, tear-stained face to back it up too. No matter which way you look at it, I'm a woman beater, and that's exactly how they're going to paint it. I'm, I'll be damned if I'm going to help them out and hang myself for it. He's not bluffing, is he? Chrissy says, her voice quiet and whispery. You really hear Eve. I don't know what's happening to me, Dolly. I choke out, trying to hold back the emotion that now threatens to overwhelm me. I'm falling apart. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry, she murmured sympathetically. I feel a hand on my back rubbing in a comforting motion and can no longer to contain my emotions come here she says taking me in her arms i turn un unable to resist her comforting arms burying my face in her shoulder i'm soon lost in her silky barbie doll blonde curls and the familiar scent of peaches and lilies tears falling with abandon she always smells the same it's pleasant and comforting sometimes like now there's also a hint of pineapple about her which is her favorite snack However did you get involved in a rape, Millie? she says. I mumble something unintelligible into her shoulder. Her smell also reminds me of Mum. Maybe that has something to do with why it's comforting. Mum often kept a vase filled with lilies, either on the dining table or in the kitchen. That was one of her things. Sometimes I'd swear she had OCD. Looking back, all the little things she did that drove me crazy were just a part of her personality. I kind of became immune to the smell after so much exposure growing up, but now I recognise it in a heartbeat. Thinking about mum makes me feel even sadder. If I wasn't already crying, I'd want to start. My shoulders are shaking as deep so sobs shudder through me, but silently. I'm too scared to cry out loud in case the, the reporter's outside here. It'd be embarrassing. That probably sounds silly, but I can't... But, since I can't hold back the tears, I hold back the sound. I don't know how long we stand like this for, but eventually the flow of tears starts to taper off. I've never raised my hand to a woman before, I tell her hair. Sniffing, I lift my head and wipe my cheeks dry with the back of my hands, ignoring the familiar but painful needles shooting through my left arm. Thanks, hun, I smile, feeling a little embarrassed and laugh a little. She smiles, giving me... A little shake of the head in disbelief, dismissing my words. Come on, I've heard you two fight, she says, turning away and heading towards the kitchen doorway. Don't shoulder all the blame there. You're not saying she asked for it, 
my gasp. Following her as far as the kitchen doorway, I watch her prepare a glass of water. I've seen what she does to you. Sooner or later, something had to give, she said, pouring half the contents of the glass into her mouth. No, I shake my head and sniff again, my nose still not clear. No way. You know I don't condone violence against women. Thinking back to the fight with Eve, guilt stabs at my chest and I feel like breaking down all over again. What's this? She says, coming over and touching my bandaged wrist. What happened? I pull my arm out of her grasp, wincing at the stinging pain that accompanies the motion. Nothing, Dolly, I say. I cut myself. Dealing with it the best way I know how, I step forward and reach into the fridge for a beer. Mike, come on, don't push me away like this, she says, touching my back. You know I'm here for you. I don't buy that. She did that to you. Too. I appreciate your support, but I've spent the last couple of years doing battle with Charlie's loser boyfriend. I pause to crack open the bottle and take a drink from it, turning to face her again. DV is horrible. She is looking at me with a worried expression, her hand still on me. My back feels warm where her hand was, as does my arm, where it is in contact with her skin. Eve's a pistol, but I could never say she deserves she deserved that, I say, taking her hand off my arm and kissing the back of it. Chrissy nods, whether in agreement or resignation, I don't know. Her eyes following me as I lift the hem of my t-shirt to my face to dry the tears away, but her eyes remain on my stomach. I was just saying, I don't know how I could forget your stance, she sighs. You know it's different if she hurt you, right? I mean, seriously hurt you, like with a weapon. Momentarily glancing at her face, my eyes lock onto my beer bottle. She had a knife, I admit. Chrissy puts her hands on my biceps and looks into my face. Then it was justified, she whispers earnestly. Don't try to say it wasn't. There is a point where it's okay to fight back. It doesn't make you a bad person. Squeezing my eyes shut, I wrap my arms around her and hold her warm body against mine. Thanks, Dolly, I tell her here. Having her in my arms feels so right. She always knows what to say, how, how to make me feel better. Although it doesn't take away the guilt and hurt I feel when I think about what happened with Eve, it is comforting to hear someone tell me what I did was the right thing to do. Planting a kiss on her head amongst her hair, I pull back and knock back some of the beer. Chrissy watches with a curious look on her face. You know, Millie, there is a world of difference between a punch and a slap, she says hesitantly. How did you hit her? Even just the memory of it, the sound of the strike is so loud in my head. Backhanded, I gulp, looking away from her and suddenly feeling sick. I knock back more beer, vainly trying to drown my sorrows. How many of those have you had today, she says. Not enough, I say, my words echoing into the bottle at my lips. Sweetie, you know those aren't going to solve anything, right? She purrs. Chrissy steps closer to me. Puts a hand on my arm and looks into my eyes, hers full of concern. Dipping the remains of the beer down my neck as I feel I feel a sudden twinge of irritation. God, I'm an idiot. On impulse, I pull back my right arm and launch the empty beer bottle across the kitchen. It sails over Chrissy's shoulder and shatters loudly against the wall just above the sink. Chrissy lets out a scream and looks visibly startled. Sorry. I press my lips together. I didn't mean to scare you. I'm annoyed with myself. It's okay, she exhales. When she restart, while she restarts her heart, my mind is still on Eve. You know, she only starts on me because she thinks I'm a lying son of a bitch who is cheating on her with every attractive woman that crosses my path. It doesn't matter how much I deny it, of course. Sounds like she knows what buttons to push, Chrissy nods. Did I say that out loud? Damn, I need another beer. I think she's just insecure, she says, stepping aside and watching me get another beer from the fridge. I know. I sigh, cracking open the bottle. You can't imagine how I feel, Dolly. I can feel the regret, guilt, sadness and feeling of hopelessness that dwells inside me expanding with every passing minute, like a star that has gone supernova. I pour more beer down my neck, still hoping I can dampen the flames if I drink enough. The worst part is that I decided to smack her, I tell the bottle, swallowing the lump in my throat and willing away the tears threatening to well up. I was so wound up I wanted to do it, Dolly. I wouldn't have done it if she hadn't come out with, with that knife, but it's done. <clears throat> I wish there was something I could say, Millie, Chrissy says, still sounding sympathetic. 
thanks. I manage a brief, genuine smile. Do you know how beat up you look? She says, looking worried. She did that to you, didn't she? It's nothing I don't deserve. I saw you scowling at my beer bottle. There is a thing called self-defence, you know, honey. She says, like I told you, if you hit her to stop her doing you serious harm, that's what it is. It's never okay, Chris, I sigh, a troubled frown creasing my brow. I just lost control. I take another drink, <clears throat> really feeling the buzz from the alcohol now. That's good, but it's not enough. I still feel torn apart. More. I need more. And take another drink. Are you sure you want to be here? I question morosely. It seems I can't go near a woman today without hurting her. Chrissy laughs, a genuine amused laugh, and her face lights up beautifully in that way that makes me feel warm inside. I don't mean to be insensitive to your pain, but that's a stupid question, she grins. The idea that you would hurt me is just crazy. I trust you implicitly. I'm touched. I give her another genuine smile, her enthusiasm brightening my mood a little. That's not who you are, she says, gripping my upper arms and staring into my eyes. Looking back into her green eyes, I feel overcome with emotion. <clears throat> but not the same kind of emotion I've been drowning in all afternoon. I think I love you, Dolly. You know, it's good to, s it's good to see you, Chris. I smile. Thanks for being here. I set the bottle down for a moment and gently grab hold of her chin with my right hand, intending to plant a kiss on her cheek. But as I lean in, she suddenly turns her head and I find myself locking lips with her. Lost in the moment, I kiss her, my hand moving up the side of her face, all my problems forgotten. The world no longer, is the, the world no longer exists. Only the heat exploding all over me is real. There is just Chrissy and me standing here, her soft strawberry lips red-hot against mine as she returns the kiss. <clears throat>